Let me just start out with uh, an anecdote. Uh, in the ninth, late 1930s, <coughs> two physicists visited uh, Albert Einstein, and uh, they um, brought with them the concern that Nazi scientists had made enormous strides in the development of a prospective nuclear device. Uh, in their view, this project was a success. It would be a game changer, and the Nazis would really get to uh, Einstein listened to this very carefully, considered the issues before him, which were obviously value issues. Uh, here we have a weapon of immense destruction. Uh, should he support it at all? Uh, at least in the extent of the United States being involved in it. Uh, uh, should he do it upon what reasons was the advancement of science or the advancement of the national security interests of the United States? Those are choices that he clearly had to make. Uh, in any event, he decided that it would be more appropriate as a value choice to communicate to the President of the United States and have the United States uh, get into this business and try to preempt the Nazis on this question. Hence was launched through Roosevelt, the Manhattan Project. So Einstein clearly had to make some choices about this. And I suspect that without his imprimatur, the United States would not have gone forward with this project. Now, the second choice comes. Uh, the man chosen to lead the project was Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer was a leading physicist of Berkeley University and a master organizer. Uh, we don't know precisely why Einstein, uh, why Oppenheimer agreed to do it. Was it because of the advancement of science or because of the national security interests? Different values, but nonetheless he did it, but were ambiguous as to the reason he did it. <clears throat> when the bomb was detonated over Japan, Oppenheimer wasn't consulted on it, neither were the other scientists. The matter had shifted from the scientific establishment to the national security establishment. And Einstein was overseen, I'm sorry, uh, Oppenheimer was overseen by General Leslie Gross, who represented the security interests of the United States. Uh, Oppenheimer was quite shocked at the extent of the destructiveness of the weapon. And uh, we can only speculate as to what he said privately, but I suspect that he would have thought there may have been other ways to demonstrate this capacity without actually having to exterminate hundreds of thousands of human beings. In any event, he opposed the creation of an even more lethal weapon, the hydrogen bomb. And in this, he was confronted by Edward Teller. Teller approaches science from a vigorously anti-communist perspective. In other words, he had barriers and he saw communism as a big threat, and he wanted a bigger weapon to contain it. Uh, in the context of this conflict between the two scientists, it was Teller who was the more effective politician because Oppenheimer had his security clearance was drawn from the United States. That's the equivalent of saying that Oppenheimer was a security threat. Uh, <clears throat> Teller succeeded, and the United States launched itself into the testing of the hydrogen bomb, several of them, in the South Pacific, uh, which created a massive consequence in the sense that the Soviet Union decided to test its weapons as well, and we had the, the nuclear arms race, and we were still in the partial close of that. And so the question then becomes uh, uh, what does Einstein think of this? What does Oppenheimer think of this? What do these represent? scientific responsibility and ultimately for that. Oppenheimer met with Einstein and Einstein uttered those famous words which said, science should be a blessing and not a curse to you. Clearly a notion that scientific responsibility required science to be constructive and not destructive. And that there was some social responsibility at least for scientists for that concept. 
their discussions, I think, relate to the creation of the World Academy of Art and Science. And the World Academy put into its creator right from the beginning the principle that the Academy would be concerned with all forms of knowledge generated in terms of the social consequences and policy implications. Now that's fairly neutral, you know. They maybe you could have said, well, the Academy should be for human rights and peace. It quite say that. <laughs> so the language, although you can imply this, is not very I'm not quite sure why this was, but I suspect that scientists at the time as they still are today are somewhat concerned about the value implications of what they do. Human rights, peace, relative security, it would be in a far more direction. There is the relatively neutral terms with the implications of that, social consequences, policy implications, uh, are easier to for the scientific establishment to digest. Now this uh, leads me into the next phase, the academy incubated for many years, but it emerged with an interesting and, uh, if you like, eclectic agenda. It's got interest in security, interest in economic things, and technology, uh, interest in the environment, and a whole range of what I would call important progressive global issues. And the Academy is distinctive in the sense that its concerns from the very beginning were always global and not national, uh, constrained by national uh, sentiments and solidarities. Um, the, the, this pushes us into the next phase, I think, which is uh, the new item on the agenda, where we have my job on the very form of the UN. Where does the Academy stand on? Where does it stand? on the saving and universalization of fundamental human rights, of eco-social responsibility for the integrity of the planet, and more. So you can see that this, from where we are as an institution, we are on the cusp of immense value challenges as an institution. And then the question is, and what exactly does this mean for our role in providing some sense of normative guidance for the integrity of higher education in our time and in the immediate future. And that's where the question of values come. Now, the, in a narrow sense, about 12 or 13 of the fellows of the academy are having the final discourse of this intellectual on the question of values. Uh, most importantly, they finally this discussion in the context of the legal profession and pose the question, at least as far back as 1945, and that is, uh, what is legal education for? What is legal education in the university for? And they took the position that legal education and training of lawyers had to be in the public interest. And to know what the public interest is, is in part a political question. We need to be able to delineate all the things that lawyers do, then figure out with what intensity they impact or do not impact as they should on the person. But it still begs the question, how do we define the person? And uh, our former president, Glasgow, and his colleagues toyed with the idea that, well, you know, the public interest has primarily something to do with the concept of human dignity. But then the question is, what do you get this human being to concept from? How do you validate and how do you sell it to the international civilization community? And so let's think the better part of their lives extrapolating on that question. I'll come back to that in a moment because there's very rich literature on this which I'll try to introduce you to in terms. Um, but uh, the, 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 the roots of this way of thinking were in part influenced by the famous uh, Swedish economist Gunnar Myrdal. And Gunnar Myrdal pioneered a form of social science research that was quite irritating in its own time. It still remains a, a paradigm of the way it's supposed to be done. He wrote a book in the 1940s called 
the American dilemma. And what he wanted to look at was race relations in the world. But how do you look at it without evaluating the end something? And where do you get the idea of a standard to evaluate it from? Well, what he did was he looked at the American experience and politics and its constitutional development, and he found that ubiquitous in this condition was the principle of equality. So then he could use the principle of equality as postulated principle to guide all his research. Now the research had a very potent effect because you could measure equality in terms of actual performance. So, but, but the central point that I made of it was that you have to have values to guide research. And here you could find the value there that it would be because the Declaration of Bill of Rights, look at the Declaration of Independence, you could its practice at least rhetorically, Hey, they're just not living up to it. Uh, so, Lasso took that and tried to develop that further. But uh, I have to go back and, and face the other elements of it. It's not only the values, it's detailing the values, understanding that they operate at multiple levels and they interact with each other. So, one value affects another value. It's really very simple example. Assuming you think that. Generating wealth is important. And then next is, what do you do with your wealth? Well, I want an act of political office, so I support politics. So wealth influences power. Well, if I need some brains to run for of political office, I get an education. Uh, if I need to mobilize compassion, I value affection. So values interplay with each other as they're sold for their own sake. It also includes every other value, making the lives more complex. But in aggregate, what national tribes show, when these work together, they help to advance the principle of human dignity, and that's where we need to go. Now, just in a nutshell, uh, the, the, one of the important reasons for values in our education <coughs> is that. Dewey and Lazarus and others had assumed, or at least developed, an idea that, that uh, education in general, and high education in particular, is concerned with the, with the transmittal of thinking skills. Literally, they forgot how to think. Now, when you're younger, it's more rudimentary, but when you get to the university level, it's much more sophisticated. The tools of thinking become much more critical for the development of the human capacity for thought, uh, the human capacity for character development, and so on. And so one of the important things that I that was to clarify to you and give us these five intellectual thoughts. And, and I summarized them in the paper, so I won't go through more, but he called these intellectual skills that, that operate across the board in higher education. Uh, the first of these was the, the relevance of values. Now, as a practical matter, why are values relevant? Because almost any problem of significance is a conflict about values. When you look at the problem, at the back of the problem, one person wants this, another person wants that, the state wants this, the interest group wants that, and so on. And so the first problem that you have to deal with is you've got to deal with values, you've got to find out what they are, you've got to describe them, you've got to bring them to bear for relevance in terms of what the problem is. If you don't understand the value of conflict, how do you know what the problem is? If you don't know what the problem is, what are you trying to solve? You see? And other thinking skills that connect up with this would be the understanding of the thing. How do these value conflicts have been handled? scientific condition, what are the causes and consequences of particular distribution and generation of values. And then the projection of future developments and ultimately creative thinking. How do we just go about trying to create a result? So these are quite there and they cut across whatever this thing you want to take. Now I just mentioned that I'm not going to go through them, but we can discuss them later. Uh, what I'd like to now discuss is this from this point of view, the, the central point that we're looking at is ultimately that the consumers of higher education 
the stakeholder in that individual suit, all their parts of the suit. And in a broader sense, the faculty <coughs> themselves in the learning process. So we deal with human subjectivity pervading all of our institutions by education. And of course, modern uh, science really does its best to preclude the consideration of human subjectivity from our day. Said, well, yes, science is objective, but we never ask the question, why did the guy choose this in the first place? Why did he go in this particular direction? And we tend to preclude this from the universe of this course. And the reason is fairly obvious. Uh, uh, science thrives in objectivity, not human subjectivity. And rather than analyzing and carefully delineating human subjectivity, we prefer to avoid it. And by avoiding it, we also avoid responsibility. Do not be so uh, I won't go into detail with that other than there are lots of different my papers summarize the, the measurement of human subjectivity. Uh, I might descend the very from economist has focused on human subjectivity as a foundation, although it's a bit confused to how you actually measure it. Yeah, I want human subjectivity. But sometimes people are stupid and then I have to avoid them. They don't know when they do it, they don't. So that's it. Uh, but I've got a full discussion that I don't want to put out here. So, so the, 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 the then question, of course, is even if you think in values, you have to think about not only higher levels of sanction like human dignity, but you also have to look at the value components of human science. So in the paper, I, I focus on the, the, the notion of the uh, fact that enlightenment is, of course, one of the objectives of higher education. And then the question, of course, even if we look at um, enlightenment as an objective, we have to contextualize it to find out how it actually functions in society. So that enlightenment is not only sort of its own sense, but it serves as a base of power with some other values in society. And therefore, the university is not closed out to the larger social process of the um, And then I went further, but to, I'm mean, stopping this reverse the, the First of all, how do we get these values? We've got human dignity, but what are the components of it? And that is itself an interesting question. The, the roots of it lie with Malinowski, who determined uh, in Southern South Pacific that human, uh, that, that human beings have needs. And the needs are frequently expressed in institutions that they generate that are specialized in the realization of those needs. So what he did was he eased value by using needs and he identified institutions in a rather rudimentary way. Redford Brown, who was a rich, Anthropologist took that needs institutional analysis and developed an institutional framework for needs as well. But we still didn't have the very complete taxonomy of what the specific values were. Last will work on this in came of three or four, but after 1948, with the development of the Universal Declaration of Human he could use that to determine that there were eight, I think, actually nine values. That, uh, that in the aggregate uh, would constitute more or less the foundation of moving towards human dignity if the values are shaped and shared optimally. Uh, and these values are first power, uh, and that's the expression for power is the shared power, the shaping and sharing of power. Well, the shaping and sharing of wealth. Uh, skill, the shaping and sharing of skill, the shaping and sharing of respect, well-being, wealth, skill, intimacy, uh, rectitude, and I added nine as six. So we have nine identifiable values which are largely influenced by anthropological literature and literature from uh, uh, the, the human rights community. Um, the needs approach 
still survived in the form of Maslow's work, uh, the psychologist, comes into the roughly, a roughly similar dichotomy of, of, of the value. So the critical question is A, to describe the value, and two, to ask yourself and what the preference is. You have to make a preference. Uh, do you prefer optimally shaping and sharing power, optimally shaping and sharing power? Or do you only want optimally produce and not share? And but the optimal shaping and sharing would, would in the aggregate hopefully produce a public order that better approximate the idea of the order. Now, so that we have this, and I just need to add one or two things. Uh, so the value scheme that we created here it was not out of the blue, it came from scientific and it came from the development of an international program. You think to get this, but we have a UN charter. We have a UN charter with its purposes, and, and it articulates as a constitutional principle the values. So it isn't out of the blue, it, there's an enormous uh, uh, consensus on, on what the values are, although a reluctance sometimes to adopt them. So we have scientific organizations, Hemming and Hoyne, when they ask, well, is your organization for or against you? Mm -hmm. You're not sure. So, so that's uh, where we are on that score and, and the, the content of this thing. Now, just a, a, a few other thoughts uh, by way of conclusion here. Uh, uh, the the uh, question of the values of uh, high education and, 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 and University is still very uneasy about the notion that the purpose of the university should be to promote and defend a universal bill of rights. It's not, it shouldn't be controversial, but it is. It's still, I think, because of the tradition of positivism, which says the university has to be neutral. Uh, and scientists themselves are always uneasy about the notion that what I'm doing may be testable by some some high standard. But nevertheless, that is a challenge that we have to consider carefully. This issue came up in the context of Croatia, where the Croatians raised the question very explicitly, what is the intellectual responsibility for peace and security? Very clear, very explicit, and an important issue. Um, and it's my great pleasure to have worked with several Croatian intellectuals who took these seriously, right, to those classes. So, and I learned that from them, respect. Um, so, uh, I think, uh, just to, to briefly summarize the, the context uh, in the lecture, we have had some important literature. Uh, the philosopher of the world came up with a theory of justice, which is a minimal theory. What he did was imagine as a blind thing over here. And you know that over on the other side of the blind thing, some people are getting screwed. So, would you choose something that permits you to survive being screwed or not? If you choose survival, you've got a theory of justice, you see. And it's an absolutely minimal theory. Uh, uh, but same type to provide a critique of rules by struggling to suggest that maybe we should deal with the international world, right? But he has an economist imperfect understanding of the world. And his concept of, uh, of uh, individual uh, uh, responsibility is quite problematic. They want to look at what subjectivity is. But they have no way of measuring it and no way of dealing with irrational problems. So he's okay, but, but I, I'm not. The, the, the most compelling uh, uh, modern uh, theory has come from Dworkin, and Dworkin has raised the question, which all of us can understand Does the individual human being have an ethical responsibility to make his or her life? a successful experience or a waste of time. And if you confront that question, you say, no, I want it to be a successful experience, 
that you cannot deny the central principles of the non self The ancient conversion, the ethical principle, into a moral principle, which is summarized as your conversion of the moral. That is more or less where we are in the conventional Now, getting back to Lazo and Mandelville, they took two fat view on this. The first view was to follow murder and Look, to postulate human beings as a principle of divine teaching and divine requirement. To postulate <coughs> and make it explicit so that if people don't like it, they can criticize it. But it's out there and it's up front. Uh, that's the view that they basically took. They took another view, I think, because it came out of the discussion I had in my And I said, but what we first in your view is you have human beings in self evidence. So, it would appear to me that every non self other would be saying, well, I also want to be myself. So they come close to both ethical and moral principles. Uh, he agreed with me, but he didn't really write it up so much. But they come close to both, and any event, I think, these two things will add to that somewhat clearly or same. Gets us pretty close to it, theoretically. Uh, just Values and human beings are not only inherent in higher education, they should be something. And finally, I was last going to give us class on ethics. And so, what is it for? Well, if you're dealing with the education of human beings, both faculty and students, you're dealing with human capital. Or as Alberto Zaccone said, human potentiality. And if that's the case, what more serious commitment can there be, ethical and moral, to the principle that we enhance and secure as effectively as possible the human capital, the human potentiality of every human being qualified to be Thank you. I wanted to, to make a few comments. Uh, the first one is said uh, we should go back to the values to solve and understand conflict. And I, I tend to agree, and then I said, yeah, but, but maybe we can have the same value and for the sake of the same value, behave completely differently. And I said, for example, justice. Imagine a country where a government is completely corrupted, illegal, illegitimate by any form, and you represent some people who say this government is illegitimate, is using force uh, at the expense of the good of others. This situation is very, very, very classical. Uh, colonialism uh, used to be such a um, legitimate uh, power, and we, we may have this issue of how to behave at, at the, with the name of justice in such a position. And I remember two, people, two kind of um, thought process. One, which is justice can be taken by force if the government is illegitimate. The other thought process is nothing justifies suffering. In one way you've got Che Guevara, and the other way you've got Gandhi. Same situation, same value of justice, completely different uh, way to, to express and to live the values. So that was one of my comments. Um, the other comment I wanted to make is um, uh, Nietzsche was saying man is something to be overcome. And, and I would say adulthood is something that has to be overcome. Ad the, being, the fact to be an adult. It's, it sounds obvious that, a kid, that kids evolve that teenagers evolve. But why being an adult would it be synonymous of being at the final stage of our evolution? Is it because we can reproduce or because we can use strength? What makes us legitimate in the use of our ability to reproduce or to use force? And I believe absolutely nothing. The only thing that can guarantee is for me to become 
a, a, a man in the sense of Carl Gustav Jung's individuation, we are not prepared to overcome our fears, to overcome our sins, our negative qualities, our shadow personality. And as long as we do not face this shadow personality, we are not legitimate in this status of being an adult. And I wanted to, to, to keep on with, with this subject of individual responsibility vis-à-vis -vis oneself to become a man. And I wanted to, I always remember that morality that is forced by belief system or governments was something that in the, in the years of 1940s in France and in Germany, by the fact that sending a Jew to jail or to a death camp was something that is both legal and legitimate, it was moral. I believe it was unethical. So morality is for me something that comes from a government, from an outside regulator. Whereas ethics come from this sense of internal individuation process, relying on whatever you want to call it, rule of karma, uh, the soul, and somebody is going to wait your soul at the end of your life to say if you've been a good person, call it God, call it St. Peter's, whatever. But there got to be someone who is responsible for your acts. And this individuation process is for me the only warrant, guarantee, ethics, and that we overcome um, the fact that we are adults but not finished. Thank you very much. Um, first, I think education sells. You know, uh, we consider that all educational programs should meet the requirements of the economy. And you can measure that by the return of investment. If you study humanities, the return is much lower after five or ten years than if you studied MIST, okay, mathematics, engineering, science, or technology. Uh, historically, the purpose of education and the value of education is different. If you look at biographies of Rabelais, for example, of, or of Humboldt, two Renaissance men, they considered a much broader and holistic form of values, of values of education, you know? Because they were interested in knowledge, in wisdom, in understanding nature, in understanding society and human being. If you take that, that education sells first, and then look at the fact that if we had to educate another 80% of the world population, we needed a GDP which is four times the size it's now. And if you consider in order to do that, to increase our GDP by a factor four, this way of growing this way of growth, which is basically a technological growth of education or an educational growth of technology, will meet the limits of our planet. So we are in a dilemma. First, we've got to grow. First, we've got to educate people. And second, we produce technology, which is sooner or later replacing substantial parts of those who are educated. Figures show that up to 30 to 40 percent of those who have higher education degrees will be replaced in the next 25 years by automation, by robots. So we end up with a very complicated dilemma. You know, we have an education system that feeds into an economic growth which produces growth patterns which are not sustainable and technology that reduces human labor at the end. And it produces an educational system which has a half time of basically five years. So if you start your program and end up in five years, 50% of your knowledge is already outdated in general, at least in life science. Um, so two questions. What's about training programs 
which are for four to 12 months only, but lifelong, you go back and forth. You go back to university for four months, high intensity training, then you go back to life. And after five, to eight to 10 years, you do the same thing again. And second, this is what my uh, president uh, uh, speaker said, shouldn't education has a different goal? Shouldn't we prepare the next generation to solve complex problems, you know? Psychologists call this indeed individuation, you know, living a purposeful life and becoming yourself. This has nothing to do with return of investment or economic growth. Let me just share with you this story, and that's this organization. Again, which is uh, very, um, which is related to or institutional partner with uh, World University Consortium, which is IAUP, International Association of University Presidents. Um, and this organization was the organization created by the founder of our university, uh, uh, Dr. Cho of Chang University, and. And, 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 and in conjunction with putting values in education, this IAUP, the organization which was created in the year of 1965, has the same spirit of putting values in higher education. That's the reason why they gathered together and, and, and created this organization. And one of the symbolic efforts done by this organization was establishing what's called so called UN International Day of Peace, which happens to be today. Happy Peace Day. So anyway, uh, that's one example of how and how and why this uh, particular day was created by this organization. And this is a symbolic day, but uh, by having this, uh, we celebrate this day and, and think about the, the meaning of peace and how the higher education institution can play a role in building peace. And by the way, this every year, every year our university is celebrating this day by having some special events. And particular, particularly this today, uh, it was the, the, the day, and and, 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 and and on our campus, very special event of today's uh, and this year's program was doctorate degree awarded to Vatslav Pavel, the late uh, president Vatslav Pavel, Czech Republic. Well, in my humble interpretation, value-based, value-based politics actually practice. It's just like fairy tales to like that. So my question is this: uh, I, I think this, this value-based education is very related to the discussion of the part, you know, the global consciousness, the evolution of consciousness, and so on. And so forth. And this is very relevant topic, I guess, and very important. And if it's possible, I would like to listen to the story again about was or academy. And this eminent organization started with this very spirit of, of, of three values in education following Einstein. And after all these years, how do you see? And then could you please share, if it's possible, could you please share with us some, some, some examples of three values in Education and so on, and, and how do you see all these users with this uh, you know, uh, uh, paradox? Thank you. Values are fascinating because you take any any story, any event when there has been progress in society, or any success story at, in any field, at any level, at the level of uh, a country or society at the level of an organization or at the level of an individual, you study any success, there are values at the basis of this success. Anything, like if you take uh, at the level of country, for instance, this legendary integrity of the, the British gentleman who, would, who could not tell a lie and who would always keep his word, this laid the foundation for uh, 
development of Britain as, as a commercial empire long before there were international laws that could enforce legal contracts. This way, each country has a value on which its, its progress and development has been based. And if we take organizations, for instance, there are these organizations which are, are known for some positive value of theirs, which has led to its uh, rising to the top in the field, like um, FedEx for its you know, punctuality, its reliability, uh, BMW for quality, or Google for its accuracy. If Google, uh, when we need anything, Google has become a verb now. And, and or Apple for its innovation or creativity. So it's some positive value that an organization follows, adheres to, that has led to its uh, rising to the top. And if we take uh, the, the individuals at the level of the individual, we again have its, uh, some very, very uh, strong values that, that uh, make people right, that make them leaders. Like if we take, for instance, you know, Mahatma Gandhi or, or Martin Luther King Jr. or Nelson Mandela, these people, they believed in the sacredness of human life and in freedom and equality for everybody. And this, this value that they very, very uh, strongly believed in, it gave them this, you know, this aspiration and the energy to fulfill their aspiration. If you take uh, Gandhi, for instance, there were uh, times when there were Hindu-Muslim riots in the country and there were places where the army was called in. Where the rioting was very intense, Gandhi went there and he said, uh, I am going on a fast till you people stop the fighting. I will fast unto death if you don't stop. And the people have stopped uh, the, the rioting. And that was the strength of his personality. And this strength came from his value. He valued the human life so much and that added value to him. So at any level in the individual, in the organization, in the society, it is values that result in success, in progress. And uh, so when values are this important, are we including them in, in our education? How are we including them? We are producing a lot of engineers and, and postgraduates and doctors. There is a lot of technical information that we equip all our students with. But what about values? Because we see that it is on the basis of values that, that uh, uh, people accomplish. Uh, in 2006, Nature published an article which said that in the previous three years, one third of the scientists had admitted to polishing or fudging or cherry picking data to suit their, their purposes. And in uh, 2012, again, the same journal, it said that the leading research papers on, on, on cancer, it could not be replicated, even using the same scientists. So what does this show about the, the quality of uh, values that we are including in our education? And uh, I would just like to conclude with, with this question or with this point that, you know, we need to look at. Um, in fact, this is something that I learned from Alberto uh, maybe a year back. The American Psychological Association, it works in collaboration with the U.S. government uh, using its uh, advanced knowledge of uh, human psychology. They devise these, these methods to take down the personality of, of uh, prisoners and get uh, data, information from them, from the unwilling prisoners. Uh, basically, uh, devices of you know, mental torture. But then the American Psychiatric Association, it said, no, we will have nothing to do with this kind of work. So we are producing associations and people with this value, and we are also creating at the same time, our education is also creating people with, with, with the opposite set of ideas that they believe in. And so I would uh, like to hear from Winston and from everybody here. How are we teaching these values? They definitely are so essential to our, to our success, to our progress, any accomplishment. And so, this is very essential to integrate values of education. And in our future education, it has to be a very important part. Okay. First one was essentially by historically problem of the state to integrate in the mode. I think that idea largely stems from some version of their philosophy. <coughs> philosophy thinks the state is state and the right to get them in the country. Now, the assumption that I work from, the assumption that I work from is different, mainly, is 
Kuyun Bilmiyiz, Sevim Bilmiyiz, Yol Kemiyiz. Asked to the world and we're asking ourselves, what is the ultimate unit of appropriate concern in the world community? Make sure you do the wrong thing. So that's the premise of our platform. And a lot of this stuff I say comes from that point of view. Now, that doesn't mean that all of these areas in the world are not being thought of and ideological and other conditions. Uh, I have a chapter in that discussion which allows to that as well. Uh, and clearly there is a the religious tradition, Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, are there. And they don't spread the, the, the perspective of individuals, you know, the subjectivity of the And so uh, I didn't quite get into all of that, but it's a bit too complex, complex. But uh, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, uh, we started with a different unit of analysis and didn't confine our analysis to the competition from the state itself and put it to the model of the ideology that we should embrace. And the problem with the state today is that it is con contending with international institutions that <coughs> transcend the state, generate state interests, and seek to empower individuals. That's a challenge that we have. Today. And the question is how does uh, higher education uh, approach the challenge of not just the state as the depository of all wisdom and knowledge? But I was referred to this community and what are the challenges. So, the uh, second point you took up, I think, was to do with the individual. And there are complexities in what we've set out here. The subjectivity of the individual is an important matter. And uh, at least in my opinion, the effort to understand the role of the subjectivity, the complexities of identity, the complexities of the uh, the market values and the complexities of human expectations on a global basis are a great challenge that have to be accounted for in the context of human liberty. Right? But human beings have become a subject of this and with complex uh, psychoanalytical concerns about how this play out in professional labor. Um, now, uh, the uh, your Question related to the wider concept of, of higher education. I thought that my reference to share enlightenment like, covered some of that, and maybe even a more broad one. Uh, but uh, certainly, I indirectly acknowledge that because in one of the papers I put in the fact that we probably are influenced by a multitude of religious leaders as well, even though we don't mention it in the articulation of secular. I, 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 you're right. Land would be quite bad inside. Quite bad. Creativity. That's an important challenge. Um, now, the uh, uh, position that I've called it with um, an example of what Ross is doing in terms of shifting the paradigm. I think the most important example here is the effort to create a new sense of political economy, uh, to shift the focus of the debate, and to, uh, to make sure that the individual's interests uh, are not lost in the way in which they generate wealth and related resources. And this idea of human capital as a sense of change is quite a big revolution of change. And we have done some stuff on that. On nuclear weapons, but certainly we are pushing the outlet to some of those things. Um, now, I think quite. And uh, I wanted just uh, to ask uh, one question. Uh, Corkin, if I spell it wrongly, probably. Uh, I have a question that, you know, if uh, we solve uh, on a uh, Based that uh, have, I am uh, in, uh, have the right, uh, you recognize me the right uh, to have a, a successful uh, self actualized uh, life. Mm -hmm. 
And I, of course, I have to grant the same right to mm -hmm. everybody. Well, it, you know, immediately it seems uh, great, but then uh, I got the problem uh, with the notion that, that, that each of us, human beings, uh, live uh, not in reality, but in the reality of our experience. And so, I don't, I'm not even sure if uh, having a successful life, uh, including me, renouncing uh, to my life, and the future success uh, to jump in a house uh, on fire that I hear a baby crying uh, that I never even saw uh, in my life. But at the same time, uh, you know, <laughs> if I am a terrorist, uh, I might be willing to sacrifice, because it's meaning for me, the, my life uh, to go in a church uh, and throw a bomb for people are crying. So, People seems uh, very complex uh, and not uh, necessarily demotivated uh, by a successful life, uh, but appears to me uh, motivated uh, to live uh, in a meaningful way. And uh, the meaning is horrifying uh, what uh, history has taught us, uh, is sometimes meaningful, to exterminate uh, Jewish people from, uh, you know, Nazi delirium, uh, that uh, it was a meaningful way, as it was a meaningful for people to denounce uh, their Jewish neighbor to get their shop, uh, or other were willing to sacrifice their life uh, to hide uh, their Jewish neighbor, <laughs> just to give a one you know, of the thousand example. So how we uh, combine uh, that uh, with the fact that uh, we are pretty complex mammals, I have just uh, a question concerning the uh, free trade doctrine. You know, markets, they uh, deliberate uh, in most cases from values. It's mm. just uh, the money which is mm. uh, We have this uh, on the global trade in every respect. And uh, I think uh, education will be an important device. Mm -hmm to ameliorate. At the same time, we have uh, some experience with social responsibility concepts and things like this, technology assessment. But, you know, the promises are quite limited. And uh, if we look at the, the coming transatlantic free trade agreement, you know, we have a big discussion in Europe and also in the United States. Do you think in the transitory period, legal devices, you are a lawyer, so you are a specialist on this, would help to tame this tendency, worldwide tendency in the overtrade, and maybe create room for the effectiveness of uh, education down and more social responsibility. I just wanted to continue with your story, yeah. Winston, your early story. Mm -hmm. It's about the, the scient mm -hmm. scientists who approached uh, Einstein mm -hmm. and through Einstein Rosenberg. Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, Lao Silan who, who was uh, mm -hmm. one of the three scientists, mm -hmm. right? because Edward Teller was there as well, mm -hmm. as the third one. But what is interesting that Silan has Einstein himself, originally as a scientist, they were challenged. Mm -hmm. So the challenge for, if I may, for Einstein was the statement of the then president of the British Society, mm -hmm. Lord Kelvin, saying mm -hmm. that by now everything has been discovered and what remains is more and more precise measurement. Mm -hmm. And five years later the, the, uh, the uh, relativity theory came mm -hmm. from Einstein. And it was very similar for Leo Szilard because the then president of the British Society, Lord Rutherford, mm -hmm. he said that um, creating energy from the atom is like moonshine. Mm -hmm. But then this, this value of scientific discovery, mm -hmm. in the case of Leo Szilard, was overtaken by a different value mm -hmm. because, and, and this is about knowledge dissemination mm -hmm. versus values which might have a higher hierarchy 
in the judgment of the scientists. Yeah. So practically in the 1930s, mm -hmm. Leo Szilard, who practically patented the chain reaction mm -hmm. together with Fermi, yeah. was in favor of keeping silence about any achievements mm -hmm. on, on nuclear physics mm -hmm. because of the fear that Germany might mm -hmm. misuse the knowledge. So it was clearly that while he was challenged in, in somewhere in 1932, later on he was in favor of practically restricting the knowledge dissemination, so whether it's research sharing or, or, or education. Mm -hmm. And then, just to continue the, the, the story, he himself was, uh, yes, uh, in, the, in the 1960s, uh, late 1950s, 1960s, part of this new wave of consciousness among scientists, mm -hmm. because, yes, this was the time when, when the World Academy emerged. Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, 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 the, the <coughs> The, the whole, the whole uh, trend was not just uh, about the World Academy of Science, but Pugwash, mm -hmm. uh, Union of Concerned Scientists, and because again, the scientists this, uh, assigned a higher value to trying to manage the consequences of what was uh, created as a result of, mm -hmm. of scientific curiosity and scientific drive. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing debate still today mm -hmm. how to apply the right uh, methodology to, to respect what is driving uh, yeah. the human progress at the same time to, to have higher and higher values. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a fascinating sure. uh, story. I didn't mean to say it was complete. We are starting with our assignment. Mm -hmm. Really stimulating presentation. I see you've been working on this oh. idea quite a bit, yes, and though I've heard we've discussed it many times. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, because of your health, you couldn't be here for the whole discussion mm -hmm. today. Otherwise, I think you would have mm -hmm. seen the tie with a number mm -hmm. of the issues that came right. up before, and I thought it might be useful to try mm -hmm. to just mention some of those ones. I love that you started with Oppenheimer because you. You started with the fact that this is not an abstract theoretical mm, yeah. uh, issue at all. This is a practical issue. Mm. And whether you're put in charge of the Manhattan Project or are designing uh, algorithms for Wall Street, uh, right. uh, this is real. Mm. And I think you made one story is enough to make the case right. that how can we think about education mm -hmm. without making it value-based. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, this was the point that Slatko raised earlier, and uh, which, which was so pertinent. Our education is so much focused on competencies, but what about character? Uh, I think it's come out really strongly, and I love uh, what you said. But you went further. You, you pointed out that there is an inherent tendency, implicit or whatever it is, that our knowledge should be value-free. Mm -hmm. That we're seeking an object of knowledge of the world and the scientist or the academician is in some mm -hmm. sense uh, detached, aloof. We're mm -hmm. just, we're not supposed to have a view on this, we're just supposed to tell you how it works. Mm -hmm. And of course, a lot of the work the Academy has been doing on economics is to say, this is not just true in the natural sciences. Yes. Uh, a lot of, most of our economics is to say, well look, this is how economics works, and we're only telling you how it works, uh, not how it should work, or how we can make it, uh, this is it, as if it's an objective thing, uh, divorced or separate from us. Then you went further, and you said that all problems involve a values conflict. Well, we are all witness to the ongoing debate between neoliberalism and Keynes and, 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 and many others. And the one thing you never hear in that debate is, look, let's get down to it. This is about values. Mm -hmm. Rather, everybody talks about this is the theory. You know, this is the principle. This is how an economy... The value is as if we're ashamed, as if scientists, social scientists are ashamed to say, look, this is about values. 
The politicians say it, uh, even if they use it to justify whatever policy they believe in. Uh, but the, there's a tendency not to put it, make it explicit. And I think your comment makes it very clear that we cannot have a science that is not value-based. And if nothing else, we should be teaching our students, or rather our students should be learning to look at every conflict in terms of values, and not just in question of who's right and wrong. Because if the question of right and wrong, uh, the neo-Keynesians and the uh, neoliberals will go on for centuries uh, at that level, uh, because you can justify any intellectual position when you have a certain implicit values behind it. So teaching and making the values as explicit is fundamentally essential for us to really come to find how do we resolve our issues. And Alberto's theme since our first program is here, and he mentioned it again today, is that all our knowledge is socially constructed. And by socially constructed, one of the constructions is the implicit values. There are others, but the implicit values behind it. So what could be more important for us in the education for the future uh, than to bring out what is implicit and, and say uh, that that's the only way we'll be able to deal with the conflicts. Uh, this morning, Sesh raised the issue of wisdom. Uh, and I came back and linked it to the idea of life, relevance to life. Mm -hmm. And I think values is another way to say that. Because essentially, knowledge based on values intended to realize human values is what we really mean by wisdom. Knowledge that leads to our destroying ourselves, however effective or powerful it is, uh, is not wise. Uh, Janani uh, mentioned uh, points which we discussed last fall, uh, and uh, we have written about, and you, all, you also have written together on this, on the fact that if you look at human accomplishment in any field at any level, that values are a basic driver for it then how could we not be teaching this? And yet, in our business schools, in our, and in our science, uh, uh, the, the research, the results that Janani quoted indicate, uh, as if this is a side issue or we should have one day on this or one unit on this, uh, rather than having values purvey our knowledge, and I think we'll hear more about this from Alberto uh, uh, in this uh, presentation tomorrow. But I go even further, even further than individual accomplishment, if we look at the evolution of the society, if we say there has been a progress of the society, individually our accomplishment is value-based, socially all the progress that we've been making, we may be, it may be very haphazard, it may be very inadequate, but we can trace it. The progress we've made is a progress towards mm -hmm. values. We have a more effective and productive society today. We have greater freedom. We have greater equality. It's, it's far from uh, mm -hmm. uh, adequate. We have a much greater consciousness of the need for realizing these things. At least the, the, the human rights are out there now. Uh, whereas it used to be uh, uh, very controversial. Nobody can challenge the right now. It's only the, uh, uh, the application. Another issue which you have spoken very eloquently about in the fall, which I thought, uh, and that is that uh, the distribution of power, which is really the determinant of the effectiveness of a society, is entirely based on what are the values the society is upholding. And whatever we say we've got a democracy or we've got a market economy or all, <coughs> we can see where the power is. And the implicit values that are supported, whether it's the values of uh, the rights of labor or the rights of speculators or uh, inheritance tax or whatever it is, it's all determining how power is distributed in the society, and values are determining that. And finally, tomorrow we have a session on creativity. I think it's tomorrow, 
that mm -hmm. have uh, on creativity and all. Uh, and uh, the individual, the creativity of the individual, the very idea that the individual is not just supposed to follow instructions or obey and conform, but is to be a source of creativity and innovation, is based on a, a fundamental value. Mm -hmm. So I get the feeling after listening to you and hearing things today that this, is, uh, this has got to be central. Uh, not just ethical, moral values are very important, but we're talking about something even more uh, more broad than that, a sense, a perception, a shared perception of uh, things that are valuable in themselves. And there may be different interpretations of that and different preferences for that, and as you mentioned, there are conflicts mm -hmm. between values to be resolved, but they'll never be resolved unless we're conscious of what are the values mm -hmm. that are at stake. So, thank you. I think that the uh, Actually, education is going in completely the wrong, wrong direction if it is not certain value based. This is something that I hope we, I mean, without clear, we're probably clarifying a little bit, but generally speaking, uh, you started with, rightly, with the atomic bomb found the fathers, mm -hmm. which was. Uh, this was actually the first innovation that depending on the values that were in the hands of the people who hold the power, depending on what values they stood for, that bomb was right or wrong. Mm -hmm. At the same time, that invention, on the other hand, uh, created power plants which actually are something which is completely on a different side of even, even, even values, especially purposes. Now, what is the invention that was made after Bonnie Bond that significantly is different one than any one before? The invention, the only invention that doesn't have any purpose when it is created is computer. Is that right? So computer does not have a purpose before you put it in certain context. Everything that was invented was invented for some purpose. But what computer was invented for, that definitely is not the purpose that we are using that today. The, the ICT and technology and connectedness, connectivity, connectivity in between us and the way in which it's going, this is another threat to society. Interconnectivity can become just like either atomic bomb, which can be in the hands of people who are teaching certain values, or it can be tool or wrong people. Can you imagine that some people in history that we taught in schools had the capacity of uh, interconnectivity? I'm not talking about Gables or or, or where. But I mean, you can just name, name it. Now, my point is very simple, is that I think that uh, the values, on the end, when we speak about values, we have different opinions about it, and we will encapsulate them differently. But there are certain values that no one, no one is, let's say, publicly complaining about, like Ten Commandments, like the golden rule of every religion, don't do to anyone else which you don't want anyone else to do to you. This is very simple, encapsulated, encapsulated core of the values that we Then we have the human rights. Then now we have, as we, we spoke just on break, uh, to, tomorrow in, uh, we have those values that are kind of moving in the sense of how being packed, which is sustainable development goals at this moment. Because tomorrow sustainable development goals are going to be adopted, and education is one of them. I mean, it starts from, you know, uh, it starts from Getting, getting rid of poverty and going to the cooperation of everyone in, in the field of accepting each other. Now, and finally, I think that in certain periods of time, and I will talk about it probably something, something I have a chance to talk about a little bit more, but there are certain uh, values that are priority in certain periods of time. 
in certain contexts, in certain parts of the world and globally. For example, uh, if, when we talk about education, we have to talk about education which will point out, I'm talking about char character, not about capability, which will uh, talk and preach and teach where inequality leads to. Inequality, mm -hmm. inequality is one of the key problems today, growing inequality. Second thing is inclusiveness, which is becoming more and more problem. And the third one, I'll finish with the third eye, which is identities that we we're talking about previously. I mean, how people can flourish, guard, protect others, and that way protecting themselves, because accepting different identities as mm -hmm. our richness, not as our ability. So, I mean, these are the things that have to be part of education from the kindergarten over sixth graders to the very president of the <laughs> So, I think that we should, and I really strongly believe that uh, we have to be much louder about not only education, but we have to be much louder about how education may go in the wrong direction. It's even, sometimes you can mobilize people more by showing them a threat than a hope. Moving them by fear, what can happen if they go in the wrong direction, than moving people by hope. Of course, when you can move them by hope, it's good. But then, uh, so clear, I mean, the hopes don't get fulfilled. But uh, if you get rid of fears, and if you show the people that fears, you prevented them to be jumping into the middle of the legitimate fears, then you did something. So that's my point, and I'm really strongly support to, to this uh, overall afternoon topic. And I went off by listening to that about the purpose and about the values. Let me clarify that. Everything will be easier because if in the beginning we make a mistake, then I hope we would not be efficient and effective after that mistake in the very beginning. When we miss the purpose of that, then better we don't get stressed. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we heard from you the little history of the developments of, in terms of Oppenheim and Einstein. Uh, the real fact is that. There was a concern after the atomic bomb. The plasma was to develop in hydrogen. That's Oppenheimer was fully against it. That's why he lost his credentials, etc. And Einstein wrote to the President of the United States, also against that. So there was a problem that there could be something that would be developed of knowledge that should cause damage to mankind. The atomic bomb that was sent to nuclear I didn't want such people something that they were against right here. Something that nature is such a bad And this is a time when the economy was great. There is a film. Uh, I think it's around two minutes. About Oppenheimer, who witnessed the before Hiroshima, there was a test in, in the summer of. Uh, 1945, and uh, I think he's citing an Indian scripture, the, 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 the book of the Gita. Yeah. And uh, what is what is coming through only from the film that the tears are rolling down on his cheek. Okay, he's saying practically. Uh, now we are the master of destruction or god of destruction, and, and there, is a, there is a line from the from Gita. Yeah, and the story of So, the... uh, yes, so practically all along this process of creating knowledge and, and pushing uh, technological evidence forward, uh, there was this, there is this uh, dichotomy because of the, of the values. Or, or going back to 1941, the, the other patent uh, uh, Leo Szilard did was on the on the reactor. So uh, Zlatko mentioned the nuclear energy. So 
in 1941 in Chicago, uh, they had the first atomic pile, yeah. uh, which, which is the forerunner of the, of the nuclear reactor. And uh, seemingly, Lao Silar that day, 6th of December 41, said, this day will go down as a, as a black day in the history of mankind. Mm -hmm. So right away, there was again this, uh, this, uh, this schizophrenic approach in between technological progress and, and the values which might be endangered as a result of, of, of progress. Or, of course, Fritz Haber, going back to 1914, on the, on the, on one hand, the Haber process on the line, uh, the, the, the simple story of the Iron Dawn is that uh, uh, terror was uh, much more effective to separate the politician in the front of the Sandwich. But thank you, Sir. Uh, uh, yes? circumstances have already resulted in the consequences that we see today as symptoms. Mm -hmm. One of the problems with therefore discussing value is what needs to change by way of the values that have driven us to where we are mm -hmm. relative to what those values need to be going forward. With that in mind, one of the things that might be worth considering is the idea of critical thinking, which is a discipline that is not taught at all. The idea of going to root causes rather than identifying symptoms as problems and attacking symptoms rather than getting to root causes. With that in mind, there is a friend of mine who has done some really brilliant work in terms of getting to root causes in the larger sense. And it's uh, basically called causal layer analysis, which starts with what you observe and then keep asking why or how did you get to the step behind. And again, persisting with the notion of why or how with that previous step until you get to the root cause, because more often than not, correctly identifying the root cause has the solution pregnant in itself. There are many forms that we are looking at the values from the perspective of a different day and not from the stakeholders. And that's an important distinction. Uh, I did stay very much, I want to go my but the establishment of an appropriate standpoint from which to observe and to make appropriate is similar to the point of the colleague. I'd like to finish with one comment. Yeah. I'd like us to be reflexive about how we work. So, talking about values in education is not a disinterested activity. We're involved in an educational activity now. We have students with us, we have people online, we are ourselves here. I think it might be quite interesting for all of us to think about what values do we want to underpin the remainder of our conversations. For me, Phrenesis, engagement, the connection of theory and practice is important. And so one of the questions I would like to think about is for the students tomorrow, how does this become a really useful experience for you and how do you also contribute to this? So can we just think about values and learning not just as something we discuss in the theory in the abstract, but as something that we actually put into practice in the design of our learning environments, please? Okay. Good point. Thank the panelists for this session.